from people sitting in the back five rows, so <laughs> if I ignore you then you'll know why. Um, always so dictatorial. Yes, sir, you're yes, coming to the front. Oh, wait, out. How <laughs> dare you say I'm dictatorial. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, for those of you who haven't noticed the difference yet, uh, Mariana sends her apologies. She couldn't be here to introduce uh, Frankie today. I understand that she's up in Westminster advising Vince Cable and his group as they're coming up with a plan B or whatever it is that, uh, that they're doing. Um, I think we're about into the, um, the sixth or seventh seminar within the Digit uh, series, uh, some sixth. Th the sixth one. Uh, Digit, as most of you are aware, is the series which uh, is trying to look at inclusive growth. Um, to marry models of smart growth uh, and try to understand why in the past that hasn't actually included inclusiveness and to see how that can be. And so as a means towards that end, um, Mariana and, her, and Damasco and others have been uh, arranging this, uh, this series of seminars and talks by distinguished economists. Now as a psychologist I always thought that was an oxymoron, but not in this case. Uh, having known Rafi now for over 30 years, I can say that I know he is an economist, but he is also quite distinguished. Uh, and I can say this of having been his horse for uh, at least 10 of those years uh, at Centrum. So I'm delighted to have Rafi here. I mean, I think most of you know Rafi's track record. He's been extremely productive. Uh, I think most recent, his most recent book is on China and the world economy. He's been looking at globalization for some time before that, uh, value chains, uh, looking at even the games development market in, in Brighton. And he's an economist who hasn't been just making contributions on the theoretical side, but all his work is getting his hands dirty and seeing actually what is going on from that. I think out of the series, I've missed one or two of them, that this may be the first uh, or, or one of the few so far that's looking at the perspective uh, from poor countries in particular. Uh, you know, we know that over, I think, a third of the world's population live on less than two dollars a day. And uh, indeed, in spite of um, some of the uh, larger third world countries, making impressive growth uh, in their economies, whether or not the uh, inequalities uh, are, are changing, I think is, is an open question. And certainly in many of the poorer third world countries, inequalities are growing as we go. So I personally am looking forward to Rafi's talk and learning a bit more about this and what can be done. And uh, it's the usual uh, 45 minutes with questions coming afterwards. Rafi, do you mind if people have points of information of while you're talking? I prefer that way. Okay. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't uh, recognize the word distinct, distinguished, and most people in my profession wouldn't recognize the word economist. <laughs> so I don't think I meet either of those. I'm proud to say that I'm not a proper economist. Uh, I once worked with an Oxford econometrician, and we submitted a paper to an economics journal. And the review came back and said, this has only got 15 equations that doesn't qualify as economics. <laughs> You're not going to see any equations here. I'm going to talk about the link between innovation and poverty. I'm going to start with a, a very distinguished theoretician of poverty in Britain called Peter Townsend, who said that poverty has two meanings. It has both a meaning in terms of absolute standard of living, and it also has a dimension of inequality of distribution. 
And we've often thought of distribution and absolute poverty as being unrelated things. But you'll know the book uh, by uh, the, uh, Pickett and, and Wilkinson, uh, Spirit Level, which looks at the distribution of income and shows the interaction between inequality and uh, all the problems of mobility, which is what we think are addressed by levels of absolute poverty. So they're often seen as two different things, but, but uh, I'm going to uh, try and focus on, on both of those. And I had a really bad night last night, so I hope you won't mind if you do the work instead of me uh, for the first while. This is the share of wages in GDP, the USA and the European Union, uh, from 1960 to 2005, and I believe that's the USA and that's Europe. As I said, I've had a bad night, so if you could work your way what, what's happening there, I'd be grateful. Uh, and perhaps this one I like, this is from Robert Wade's recent piece, I like his sentence at the end, but again, if you could do some of the work there. And most of all, since I'm going to be talking about developing countries, I'd like you to do a bit of work on the following few tables. Uh, that's the growth of per capita income, 1990 to 2000. That's the world, China, India, and the USA. And that's them. Now, before we were talking about inequality, now we're talking about absolute poverty. These are people living below what's called $1 a day. This will stop working, sorry. These two columns here. Again, the same, 1988, 1990, 2007-2008. Uh, it's striking that the red one, uh, that the number of people in the world living in absolute poverty fell by 500 million people. And if you look at the Chinese story, it stopped working. I'm going to have to stand and uh, sit down, I'm afraid. If you look at the Chinese story, uh, can you see it at all or not? Yes. Chinese growth rate, 10, 9, 10% for 20 years. Number of people in absolute poverty falls dramatically. In fact, it falls by more than the aggregate global fall in poverty. Um, and if you look at India, we see uh, a break away from the Hindu rate of growth, 2% a year to 5.5% in the 1990s, 7% in the 2000s. Number of people in absolute poverty have increased. And if you look at the part of the world that I'm particularly interested in, Africa, you'll see that Africa's growth rate uh, more than doubled between the 1990s and the 2000s. It was 50% greater than the global growth rate. This is extraordinary performance. And yet the number of people in absolute poverty in Africa went up from 224 million to 355 million. <coughs> we don't have a problem of growth in the developing world. The rich countries might. We have a problem about the nature and the structure of growth. And that's the key thing to get our minds on, certainly from the developing country perspective, that outside of China, and I would argue that part of this phenomenon is directly explained by that phenomenon, that there's some element of a zero-sum game, that for much of the world, the high rates of growth have not cured the problems of absolute poverty and have been associated with uh, increasing inequality. Now, there are a number of reasons why that should uh, be the case. Uh, Globalization is inherently unequalizing. If you've got a rent, if you can do something which other people can't, you've got a much bigger arena to appropriate your returns from. If you don't have any rents, if you have things which many other people can do, I'm thinking here of unskilled labor and semi-skilled labor, you're competing in a much larger pool. And it's not, it's not surprising, therefore, that as globalization has expanded, so inequality has increased. Well, I suppose most economists wouldn't believe that because they see a world of full employment and a world of specialization and comparative advantage where we ultimately will run into a shortage of labor as parts of China have run into a shortage of labor. Wages will go up and we'll have more and more skills around the world. The returns to skilled labor will go down. But once you remove from the economic theory of comparative advantage and win-win outcomes to world trade, once you remove the assumption that the labor market clears, that there's full employment, then put that together with the more than doubling of the global labor force in the 1990s when the former Soviet Union and China entered the global economy. 
it's not surprising that we see this growing unequalization. And with unequalization, we see a growing marginalization of people who are unemployed. More than 50% of the world's population now live in cities, and the cities used to be places of industry employment. The cities are now the dumping ground for the unemployed. Now, another reason why we see these patterns of inequality and global uh, absolute poverty is financialization. And we have here, as it were, a political process going on. If you think of a Marxian explanation of capital and labor, and then you take um, uh, Nikos Palantzis, who talks about fractions of capital, and you break capital down into financial and productive capital, we see a phenomenon in the world, which I'm not going to talk about, because Mariana and others know great deal about it, a wonderful piece by uh, the Zonic on financialization, which is that the returns from growth, the surplus in growth, is increasingly appropriated by an unproductive class. <coughs> and that's, as I mean, Carlotti would argue that there are technological innovation routes to that, which there are, but it's more than that. And this would be another reason why the high rates of growth which we're observing are not associated with falling levels of absolute poverty in many parts of the world and why they're associated with an increasing unequalization. But the last one, the one I want to talk about, is that the trajectory of innovation. Innovation is also part of the explanation of unequalization and global poverty. Now, I've, I've, I've gone through that because I want to make the point that this isn't the whole story. Innovation has a role to play, an important role to play, and in many of the writings of the economics of innovation and skilled labor and returns to skilled labor, it's as if the income distribution story was wholly explained by technical relations, which are different. But I want to talk about that part now. So what I've done is to try and situate this in a much larger picture. Uh, and I'd like to go on a bit, Harry, and then we could perhaps stop for a minute if people have questions. We then have to ask the question, what 